as, as Will said, this started off a while back and it was really because I didn't have any time and he was like, oh, we really want you to come, please. And I said, look, I'm just going to put something on. I was really sort of disappointed with a lot of the questions that I have when we go out, that everybody has when we go to uh, conferences like this. But yeah, I always thought when we're in the pub at night, we all start arguing and debating and talking about all the things that we've just been hearing about. And I thought, I'm just going to try and bring that to the conference towards the end of the day and have a beer and get everybody a bit loose um, and maybe a bit of talk about a controversy um, and see where we go. So I have some people. Oh, also, we did a, we do a podcast as well, part CTC, um, which I want to push. Um, so this is kind of the first one I think we're doing live. It's being recorded, I think, hope. So um, we're just going to try and talk about a lot of the things we said today. And hopefully we're not going to come out with any conclusions. We just want to stir the debate and find out what we want to do. So I've got some partners in crime and the guys are going to come on. So I'm going to introduce Lille Bjorn Gilfeld, uh, Managing Director of Cinema Design. Yeah. And Guillaume Brandes, who you all met earlier. Um, and on the podcast, we also have Tony Purvis, uh, Director of International Delivery and Operation um, Partners at Amblin. Uh, as well as Kevin Markwick, um, who's our who's our heart of the podcast, um, and they are going to be joining live. <laughs> so anybody that is fans of the podcast, we got the whole crew in for you. So um, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna start. Uh, hopefully, if this clicker works. Yes, with the first question, which is. Uh, laser warranty. We talked about laser warranties earlier on today, and the and the, the lack of them, uh, or the, the smart warranties, uh, whatever Tom said it was called, um, that you can take out. And I wanted to investigate that a bit further. So one of the things I found out was that you know when, when you see a lot of the literature on the the, the the main three, I suppose, projector manufacturers' websites around, you know. This light will achieve 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 lumens. Um, we always took it for granted that that was a guarantee because in the Xenon world, we'd always had the light guarantee. You know, if it was a four kilowatt lamp, it would be around a thousand hours roughly. And if it failed, then we either had a pro rata warranty or we had a 100% warranty. And our light was covered. And what I was just a little bit disturbed to find out was. You know, it's the laser light isn't hasn't got that warranty. Doesn't doesn't give us that security as an exhibitor. So I just wanted to question that, and it was like, well, yeah, we don't we don't really have a warranty on it, not not in the traditional sense. Uh, however, there may be options for the future. So, um, is this something that you think people are thinking about, Lillibion? Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, if uh... Of course, if there is a factory default on the laser light source, perhaps that will show up in the first year or two. Uh, but like you say, <laughs> you are going to use the projector more than that. Uh, and of course, if uh, if you do everything right, you have, uh, like Tom said, also a perfect uh, 18 degrees uh, in the booth. You do everything right and you still lack a little bit of light when the projector is five years old, of course it's a problem mm -hmm. uh, because perhaps you need to buy a new laser, uh, laser plate and that's quite expensive. Mm. Um, and uh, of course this is, this is more or less perhaps the second time that most of us has been meeting up again, the first time in, in yeah. Barcelona uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, and uh, also been starting to discussing. So, uh, it's an important question, of course, and it needs to be addressed. But yet again, uh, also, if you buy a car, like Tom said, perhaps there are limitations in, in the warranty. You can't do whatever you like and still be covered. And this is, well, this is a new technology that has pros and cons. And this is one of the cons, perhaps. Uh, I don't have an answer more than more than saying no yes well that at least i was looking for the one from you yeah but starting 
So, I mean, you're talking about, um, you know, not having a, a, a warranty. Um, you know, it's one of the downsides, and Tom was comparing it to cars. Where's Tom? Tom, put your hand up. Hang on. Um, but we're not coming from driving cars. We're coming from using Zenon lamps. And in a Zenon lamp world, we have a warranty, and therefore we must have some form of warranty on the laser light source because we've, we've been used to having that protected you know, on the, on the warranty. And this is the uncomfortableness that I find um, that going into it, because I'm just going to advance the slide slightly. And this is not accurate data. I put, everybody has really nice graphics. I don't, I have to make them myself. So sorry, um, you know, I don't have a budget. Um, so, you know, this is, this is me. And, and what I've heard some people budget. say. Budget. Budget. Oh, budget. oh budget. I don't have a budget either. Uh, <laughs> um, so what I'm what I've heard some people say is, well, what do we what do you want a warranty on, Mike? Because you might not be running the projector at hundred percent power from day one. It's like I definitely won't be running at hundred percent power from day one if I can help it. But I think, you know, when it comes to Xenon lamps, I'm looking for a commensurate kind of warranty on the Xenon lamp. And I'm, I'm looking for you know, your warranty on a Zenon lamp is based on the maximum kilowatt, you know, for the amount of hours, which is about four kilowatts for a thousand hours. It should be fine. If it isn't, we're warranty against it. And that's what I'm looking for with a laser projector, which is, you know, what, what it does on the tin is what, I'm warranty, what I want the warranty against. Um, if I want to underrun it and hope it lasts longer, like I would in a lamp world, then that's up to me as an exhibitor, surely. Um, and, and that's just good practice if you can do that. Um, but I want the warranty to last uh, based on running it at maximum power um, for 40, 50,000 hours or whatever it is. Um, so, you know, if, if you run it 90%, 80%, 6%, it's going to last you longer with the right condition, you know, cooling and things like that. Um, and that's fine, but we want that warranty that's based on that thick line there, which is what the literature is saying. What what disturbs me is the average um, hours, Tom. Um, does that disturb anybody else? Not in a horror film kind of way, just, just you know, it, there's average, average when you're talking about a thousand hours, fair enough, when you're talking about 50,000 hours, a long time. What's really disturbing is, is really the lack of knowledge around all of this and the access to data and so on. I mean, if, if even Yan or you have still questions related to the impact of uh, ambient temperature on lifetime of, of the equipment, I can only imagine what smaller uh, operators will think about all of this. I'm sure they, they're not even considering it. So they're just believing the manufacturer, which is right to do, but there's, there's really the need to, you know, make, make it more accessible, the type of information for, for all to be discussing this. Mm -hmm. But then also, yet again, if you compare the, the smaller cinema that perhaps have one screen, uh, of course, it's a problem for them uh, to to not have the proper light output in, in, in perhaps uh, some years in the large span of the projector. But for this guy who has, I don't know, how many screens do you have throughout Europe to take care about? No, <laughs> you don't know. Uh, it's plenty. Uh, but, you know, just having 10% of those screens not be able to, to achieve the light output after five years, that's that's quite a decent amount of money as well. Absolutely. Um, but it's not just for the smaller ones, it's also for the really the largest one. Mm -hmm. It's about two and a half thousand. But you're right, it is, you know, even a small percentage is a big number for, for someone like me. I mean, I'm not, I'm not normal, um, you know. <laughs> But quite big. Um, not everyone's as big, but you know there are still some that are pretty big. So you know, it, is, it is a big issue. But are you? Can I? Can I ask? Are you talking about two different issues here? One is the warranty. One is how long the damn thing lasts. I'm a bit confused. Um, <laughs> I couldn't hear me. It's getting Hello. his phone changed. Uh, 
Mike is getting a new microphone. That's what's happening. Mike has a new mic. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Here are the votes of the British jury. <laughs> bingy, bingy, bong. Deux points. <laughs> diggy, diggy, dig. Is he wired up yet? Can you hear me? Yes, we're back. I can now, oh, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I can't remember what my question was now. I remember <laughs> it. Um, it's about both. It's about how long it lasts uh, as a as a general rule, as in what the literature says it should last, and it's normally around 50,000 hours uh, from 100% to 50%. It, it can vary depending on the model and whatnot, but generally that's what it is. What I'm trying to understand is, you know, is it warranted for that 50,000 hours? Um, at 100% output, you mean? At 100% output. Right. Knowing that if we run at seventy percent output, we could probably get more than fifty thousand hours, but the warranty covers it from a hundred percent output. Mm. Is, that, is that clear at all? Yeah, no, I understand. I mean, and again, I'm playing catch up, and the manufacturers, what's their answer when you ask them that question? Sorry if you've already answered it. <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> we have some room. I did. I did warn them that I was going to pick on them. Right. Uh, so I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm warned, Tom. Sorry, Tom. <laughs> Um, but I mean, Tom, Tom mentioned earlier on that there are warranties that you can take out, but they cost extra. Um, and, you know, going back to my lamp world, you know, it doesn't cost me extra in a lamp world. It's part of the price. Um, so how, how, do we, how do we fix this? And I just, you know, there's no answer. I'm not going to find the answer today, but I just wanted to raise it as, a, as an ongoing concern that we should all be looking into. Because uh, otherwise, and, and also, I'm not looking for um, a little bit less than it's giving out. You know, I'm not looking for, well, you know, it says after 20,000 hours, you know, it should have only degraded to 90% and it's at 89. You know, I want, I want, I want to claim on the warranty. We're not looking for that. We're looking for like big drops, um, you know, or after 20,000 hours, which is what, five, six years, five years, roughly. Um, that's a long time, and then all of a sudden your light drops, and because your existing two or three year warranty has expired, if you didn't take an extended warranty, and some will, some won't, then you've effectively got a light source to replace. It's quite expensive. Um, so, as I say, I think you should just raise this. Yeah, and also, you know, the 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 laser light source in. in cinema projectors it hasn't been around for as many years so all the calculations that the manufacturers do are based on statistics right uh, but then also we can see uh, pro uh, defending the manufacturers a little bit that we can see now the series two projectors they are really great great quality uh, piece of kit uh, we can see that now that uh, uh, everybody asked when we put them in in 2011 12 for how many years is they going to last and the answer from us was well for how long do, does a computer last seven years <laughs> something like that and now we can after seven eight years we can see if you have maintained the projector correctly and you have a dust free cool environment in the booth the uh, the projector will probably last perhaps up, up to 15 years or mm -hmm. something like that. We can see they're quite well built. So hopefully <laughs> the laser projectors with the laser light source would be in that span of quality as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't answer the question, but just fingers crossed. No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because we're talking about uh, this afternoon about sustainability and you know extending the longevity lifetime uh, of equipment in the long term, really making it possible to uh, extend the lifetime of equipment by 10, 15 to 20 years and so on. And that also that was a reason why many uh, exhibitors invested in uh, laser in the first place. So when we have this conversation about warranties, it's all counterproductive, really, and illogical, really, that investment. No, you should read it. Yeah, no, it is. Kevin, um, you've got a cinema. Um, I've got two now. Got two now, yeah. <laughs> Way behind the times. Um, 
Would you, are you the kind of person that would take out extended warranties in your cinema for your equipment? Um, I haven't done in the past because I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm a wild west rider at the gates of oblivion, but, um, you know, I don't know. I haven't done, I've tended to, in fact, I've replaced projectors at the, you know, I've, I've done a couple of years without warranty and then replaced projectors, which might not, I, I can imagine wouldn't be the favorite of, uh, of, of everybody to do that. But if I'd spent all that money on a laser, then I probably might think about it most definitely because that seems like an awful lot of money to fork out for five years of light to me. But there you go. Mm -hmm. No, it is. I mean, it's not. It, 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 it presumably. I mean, you might you 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 do the maths all the time, but presumably it's still better than the Zenon, even if you put it throw it away in five years. Would that be right? It doesn't sound right to me. But if it is, then no, no, I don't think five years. Is no, possible. no. You've got, to, you've got to have it running long. I mean, my job is to try and make them run as long as they possibly can, um, mm. and I will. But a 50% light output after five years would just give you the hump, wouldn't it? Yeah, so that's why you obviously want to run it. You know, so that, I mean, let's get things into perspective. You know, the, the, the chances of it failing and it degrading below that 100% line is probably slim. It's just that it okay. is... It isn't um, confirmed. You know, all of the tests we've done have said that it's probably going to get there. I mean, it's probably going to be fine, but it just leaves exhibitors in a really uncomfortable position where it's not mm. warranty. It's not, you've not got that guarantee, which is probably okay if you got one or two. If you've got 500 or 1,000. I mean, I have to say, again, being very parochial about it, the, the, the Zenon warranty for me, the most important thing was less less the cost of the lamp and more the fact that it could take your lamp house with it when it blew up and that was covered as well. That was very important. Mm. So yeah. I'm assuming that I assume that if a laser blows up, the town goes with it, is it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe your town. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. It seems, sorry, it seems quite unfair to me that all of the risk in this situation is with the exhibitor as opposed to the manufacturer. It doesn't seem quite right for the risk to be placed with that, that way around, especially with the new technology, if it's constantly being developed and constantly being worked on, and we don't know the results and findings uh, because it hasn't been around for long enough, then why should the exhibitor spend a load of money and not have a guarantee in place? It just seems mm. absolutely absurd. And basically be a test bed for the technology ultimately exactly yeah no agreed obviously <laughs> <laughs> um have i got any well i know i have some of them are projector manufacturers who's brave enough to to, to say something mark kendall do we have a we have a bravery award going to mark kendall somewhere <laughs> talk amongst yourselves this is what happens when you've had a beer. Yeah, that's the point. <laughs> um, as, as Tom said earlier on, and, and uh, Kevin and Tony forgives, um, you weren't uh, party to the presentation that Tom gave. But the, the point is, in terms of uh, warranty, there are many factors for laser to consider. It's not just the uh, single projector uh, light source. Um, and I would also add that, you know, at the end of the day, Everything's possible, but there's always a cost there. Um, I don't know because I'm not a lamp manufacturer, but there may have been that as a lamp supplier, there was a, let's say, a 10% uh, additional cost there that you never really saw, but it was there to give you some form of warranty. Now, as a manufacturer of lasers, if we added a 10% cost to the cost of a laser, which you're already complaining about possibly being a little bit more expensive, if we add 10% to that cost, then maybe as a manufacturer, and I don't, don't specifically talk about NEC as something we're going to be offering, but just generally as a manufacturer, maybe we could offer that warranty for, for the 50,000 hours. Um, we'd need to do the mathematics, but then as an exhibitor uh, or exhibitors, would you pay for that? I think you'd pay for it. Um, well, I, I'd probably pay for it in a flash. But again, we'd have to do maths. Um, it's all about the maths. But but again, surely the maths has already been done if there's a price for an extended warranty. 
Yeah, but the point only is that there's an extended warranty there from most manufacturers that will be up to at least five years. Some would offer perhaps longer, but um, that doesn't necessarily, well, it's not going to cover 50,000 hours. Yeah, so it's five years or seven or eight or ten, or depending on what you've agreed with you, um, with your supplier. Um, you know, and that, that also covers more than just the laser light. That covers the parts and everything else that goes with an extended warranty. Um, so it, it, it does cover, but again, the, the, there's, there's some intricate detail in, in that warranty about what it covers when it comes to light source. Does it cover standard general degradation of the light or does it cover on-off failure? Um, you know, it's failed, it's not on at all, rather than it is on, but it's just not as bright as it should be. Uh, because there are quite important distinctions in that. I mean, that, that struck me when you, when you mentioned this in our conversation with the, with the Unique Tech Group, is that many clearly hadn't many, maybe read the thin line in the warranty contract, but that's another detail. But I was I'm going to ask you a question. You said you, you wanted to be able to do, the, to do the math, but do you have access to the numbers, to the data, to do the math, actually, or on not really? Nobody asks me questions on this. <laughs> That's not how it worked. You know? <laughs> uh, I probably don't, but I'm sure it's available. Um, sorry? Yeah, yeah, we've got that information. We've been reliably told by Phil. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, okay, so we're just raising the issue. I'm sure you've all got the message, so let's move on. Uh, we have got a bus to catch. Um, so I can't read this from here. <laughs> uh, two meters, where am I going to get two meters from your bum? Um, you can't see this, guys, but it's about the optical hazard distance that Guillaume was talking about earlier on um, and how, you know, we, it's, it's a real problem potentially uh, going forward. I'm just going to forward the slide because the next one kind of it. <laughs> shows it as it as it really is um, and this is the ruling which is you have to maintain this is europe only by the way um america don't have to do this for legacy installs only new installs and i think theirs is 2.5 meters so there's there's, a, there's pros and cons um but we have to maintain this two meter gap uh from the back row to the to the light beam and for a certain distance out from the lens depending on the power of the projector and the type of lens that you have um which you know can be as little as you know centimeters you know up to a meter or whatever uh, up to you know up to two maybe even three meters out depending on as i say depending on the projector um so you know this is this is a problem on a new build this picture is a new build this is the west end that was that, that um Andy talked about earlier on, this is our new screen too in West End, and we had to create that little promontory into the room in order to su successfully achieve that two metres, uh, because if it had been further back, we wouldn't have been able to achieve that two metres. So this is a direct result of that regulation. Um, and this is a new build, which you can probably do most things right on a new build um, most of the time. Uh, it's not always such a blank canvas as people think, as Rolf knows. Uh, so can I ask? Can I ask an idiot question then? Why? Uh, I mean, are you going to bore light through the back of somebody's head if they uh, get in the beam? Is that what's going to happen? Yeah, you'll die. Will you? I don't know. I mean, I'm genuinely curious. What is the reason for it? Is is it a danger? I mean, presumably, are we are we talking about laser here, or are we talking about any light source? Any light source. Well, that's just Sorry. stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So we've decided it's stupid. We can move on. Um, well, no, I know, it, but it is. It, no, it, you know, common sense says it's stupid. But the reality is, is that it's a new regulation from the IEC. And the reason... So where's that going to leave things like preview theatres is all over the West End of London and things like that? Uh, they're going to have to... Well, the thing is with preview theatres, because yeah. they're not public, they could probably isolate the area underneath the portal so no one can enter that area which is what you can do um but if you do that in a, in a lot of the commercial cinemas then you're obviously going to lose a lot of seats uh, and, and so who came up with this who came up with this should we go around their house and have a word 
<laughs> we could do. Do you know Guillaume? Who can we go to? I don't know exactly, but the thing is that it wasn't only related to to cinema projectors, uh, as far as I know. So it, it was a much much broader issues, and unfortunately we got dragged into it. What's really annoying is that we only learned about it this year. So maybe we could have done something about it, but we'll never know. Yeah, agreed. Um, and this. Wait, uh, wait, we're not in Europe anymore. <laughs> yes, yeah, we, we are. We are. Oh, we are. We keep you for the map. We actually. Are. Um. So yeah, just just for the bad things. So. It's uh, it it is something that we still have to account for, even in the UK. Uh, but it is mostly Europe that this is an issue because it's a legacy as well. If you replace your projectors, effectively, you have to abide by this new regulation. Um, however, you know, I'm reluctant to say this uh, because I don't want to give people the wrong impression that you can just flout the rule because you shouldn't really. Uh, but I don't know anybody that ever comes into a new build and checks for this stuff. <laughs> The two meter police. Excuse me, sir. I yeah. think actually the two meter police is definitely a prevalent thing nowadays, given you know pandemic. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Um, so, Lily Bjorn, will this affect how you design cinemas? Because you work for cinema design. Yeah, uh, <laughs> not that. Mostly, Rolf is the one who is doing the designing, uh, but but. Uh, yeah, a, a lot of my projection sales is to our customers that it's not a new build. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, and just a projector swap. Uh, they perhaps had the old Series 1 projector and would uh, purchase a new one for, uh, from us. Uh, and that's me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I found My that. old job. Yeah, I uh, found that one. Uh, but, you know... It, what I can do is tell my customers about it. Uh, as up to now, it hasn't been really an issue. They well, we they have, we have taken away seats and bought, built like a little fence so people can't come in. And, and my idea is to educate them that this is a regulation and you you have to take this in consideration. And it's all it's not only that. It's also you know in the same text you can read about yeah, the exhibitor, the uh, the one who runs the cinema needs to educate their staff and so on as well to tell them it's it's dangerous close to the lens. Mm -hmm. uh, so you need to, you know, in, in the same text you, you need to place a plaque on the door into the booth uh, where it's, it says staff only. That's just what you need to do. And there is no, you know, uh, they don't tell us how we should uh, cut off the auditorium or anything. Mm -hmm. We should just do it. You should uh, make sure that people uh, in the audience uh, don't come into the beam close to the projector. Mm -hmm. That's more or less. Guillaume, um, we were talking earlier, because um, we do. And who, whose responsibility is this? Basically, if someone decides to stand in front of, of the projector and look at it for a very long time and get very, very hurt, um, and I mean, that the clearance wasn't, the, that the safety rules were, weren't respected, it will be first the cinema operators that will get sued because the only responsibility of the integrator is to inform the cinema operators that there exist rules, a rule, and the only responsibility of the manufacturer is to Make sure that they have updated their user manual for the projector, and they also mentioned the the, the safety rules in, in the in the manual. So it, it will really be the responsibility of uh, exhibitors. So it's the exhibitor again. The exhibitor yeah. again that has to take the rap with his crappy laser light boring through the back of somebody's head after five years. I mean, really. <laughs> what I find find quite interesting about this is that. Existing projectors are absolutely fine, safe, don't have to do anything about the existing setup because those projectors are absolutely fine. Replace that projector with a like-for-like -like projector and then you have to put this measure in place. That just makes, again, I've used this word a lot, it's absurd. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. I can go and you know stand in that two-metre zone in my current cinema. They do a like-for-like -like and then I can't stand in that space again. You know, The risk is the same. It's just 
stupid. We've peaked Erland's um, interest yeah, here. Yeah, I, I, it's Alan. I'm running this cinema. <laughs> if anyone hasn't noticed that yet, uh, we we actually have. We, we just saw an example of that, and I did it myself just a minute ago to yeah. prove a point. <laughs> yeah, I did prove a point. But we have taken out two back seats here, and roughly in regulation. Mm -hmm. Don't don't find the yardstick and measure just believe it's okay <laughs> but we see people going through the fence uh, over the barrier all the time mm. they don't get they don't bother to go around and we have a plaque saying uh, don't look into the projector you probably will go yeah, blind if you stare into it for 10 minutes if they do that it's fine i mean it's just a problem so yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but it's a problem if we get sued because people are stupid mm -hmm. no no you won't get sued i mean if they went uh, over the, the bar on which you said you shouldn't go on top of the okay. bar, it's fine. Yeah, then yeah. we're fine. You're, you're safe from stupidity. Can I, can I do a comment too? I, I, I knew you would because you rang me about three in the morning sweating, going, this is ridiculous. Yes, I do. I do. And I'll continue doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, if, if someone stops and stares into the projector, uh, that's that's blame on the customer. It's not, it's not. But as long as, th this is calculated on the, quarter of a second, you know, if you get damaged in less than a quarter of a second, uh, which is hard to prove, but if you, someone intentionally stares into the lens, uh, it's not to blame the, 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 um, the logical extension of this is we're going to have to put stickers on windows on a sunny day saying, do not look at the sun, it could damage your eyes. <laughs> Depending on how what what lens is on the sun and how yeah. large that right. is. Yes. Only if it's a new window though, that's all. <laughs> old old windows, fine. Anything from the Tudor period. Look at the sun, no issue. That is a terrible picture of me. And you can, you can use it. sunglasses, you can have a pair of sunglasses next to the projector. So when you pass it, please put on your sunglasses. Yeah, two two D glasses. <laughs> what if someone was standing? 10 minutes in front of the projector <laughs> and I was watching the movie. I would say, fuck, walk that, bring that evil. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That, that, that is the only positive of this situation. It does mean that if you have that two meter gap, there will be less people getting up to the toilet halfway through a movie and in ruining my experience. So one silver lining there. So it's a problem we need to um, think about when we're looking at uh, new installs and legacy installs as well. So when we're replacing projectors, we do need to take that into consideration. And the seats that we're removing as well, just to point out, they're not, you know, they're the seats at the front that might not get sold very quickly. They're pretty prime seats at the back for a lot of people. So they are prime seats we're having to remove, which is something my, my boss will or, or we only sell them to short people. <laughs> <laughs> your seat. Absolutely. I'm sorry, sir. You're just too tall for the back row. If you'd like to move forward. <laughs> just so people know, there have been, I think, three accidents related to 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 laser oh, uh, in the past. Yeah. In the past, I don't know what ten years or so. Fifty, 50 years. Three, yeah, fifty years. Only three accidents, and two were from uh, staff members who. It's, it's not exactly the same issue. So only one customer somewhere, I don't know what he did, uh, was hurt. So. And there wasn't a, he didn't sue anyone. He probably did something very stupid. Yeah. <laughs> but, but on that, I mean, that, no one knows what Zenon is like in the industry, really. I mean, some do, but most don't. Um, but does the, does the fact that, you know, a cinema might advertise that it's laser projection bring a certain stigma around safety because everybody knows you're not supposed to point laser into people's eyes? Uh, if people think it's laser projection, they're thinking, mm, well, that shouldn't really be in my eyes, or, you know, is it safe? Is that is that something to be concerned about, do you think, or...? I really don't know. I guess I guess those who sell laser projectors have maybe done surveys asking <laughs> asking audience that, that type of question. I really don't know. But the, the, the problem is not laser, it's bright light. Yeah, well, yeah, but I mean, it's it's going to be just laser, because uh, that's, that's what you're all pushing on. Mm -hmm. This is between the DCI and the uh, 90 foot Lamberts. It could yeah. melt your eye. This <laughs> yeah. is amazing. You only be able to sit on the front row. Not with the LED. 
Okay, we're going to go on because it's we've got 22, three minutes left. So, um, scope, flat, flat scope. I'm sick of it, frankly. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't know what, I don't know which end is up anymore. Um, and when we're building new cinemas, what, 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 what got me thinking on this was the Suicide Squad. I watched Suicide Squad. I'm not proud of it. But it, I saw a tweet from James Gunn saying we didn't play it in, uh, we didn't make it in scope, despite the fact that it's a big superhero film, anti-hero film, whatever. Um, we made it in the taller aspect ratio of 1.85 because we knew it was going to be playing on IMAX screens. And I thought that was a really interesting, um, this isn't that tweet, but this is another tweet that he did. Um, I thought it was really interesting that they changed it round, you know, so that scope was no longer wider than flat. It was that flat was now taller than the scope. Um, and I thought that was quite interesting and whether that was a direct result of digital, does that challenge the, dare I say, romanticized view of, you know, flat should be flat and then scope should always be wider than flat, which I get and I kind of agree with. But at the same time, you know, is the perception, particularly with younger people um, and the fact that they're watching a lot of things on, on phones, unfortunately, um, does that change things? I'm not saying it does or doesn't. I'm just asking the question. Um, because generally we have this. This is what we had for the vast majority of movies when it came to 35 mil, which was flat and scope. Well, we 185 and scope, flat came in with digital really. Um, but then the more we got into a digital world, the more we started to see 2.1 and then 2.2 to one in a flat container. And then we would get like two point, well, we got 2.1 to one and 2.2 to one. Uh, and then we would get, you know, Robert Eggers and his uh, witch film and Lighthouse with, you know, the, the, the really narrow ratio. And then we get Quentin Tarantino going the full full hog widescreen. And we're getting lots and lots of film directors. And in some cases, top film directors that are changing uh, the ratio all the time. And I'm not here really to say, stop doing it, you bloody fools, because you're ruining our screens. Because uh, I don't think we, we can. We shouldn't be trying to curb creativity. Um, we need to, I, I'm thinking about how can I create a screen that can accommodate as many of these ratios as possible without having to go with, you know, moving masking and everything else, which I would love to do uh, everywhere. But some people just don't like moving masking. So how can we, um, how can we have like floating screens that can accommodate most ratios? Uh, and present them in the best way forward. Mm. Um, so. I, I blame I blame cinemas and their laissez-faire attitude to masking. It's just allowed this to run riot, frankly. Is it is it, it that way, Kevin? Because I I can see lots of films, lots of TV shows being filmed in these rogue ratios. You know, I know. I was, I, was being, I was being a bit I was being a bit fruity, but what I mean is that. You know, uh, we 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 always had you know cinemas always have masking, and then when they stopped having masking, presumably that you know it means that nobody cares about masking. So you can you might as well just have a big white sheet and put whatever shape you like on it. Uh, ultimately, which I think is a shame, but you know I'm just an old old leg. <laughs> what about you, Tony? What's your thoughts on that? What do you, what do you care? What it's like? Can you like just fill the wall with screen? Andy even said that earlier on in his presentation. He said, you know, a lot of people just want to fill the wall with as much screen as possible and they can put the biggest image possible. Um, I think that, so I, I'm I'm younger, but I still have that uh, old lad mentality like Kevin. I enjoy my moving masking. Um, I think there's a, a time and a place and it comes down to creativity in, at the end of the day. I mean, I love Wes Anderson and Wes Anderson uses all of the aspect ratios all in one go. Um, hmm. So, you know, I think if it suits the film, then it suits the film. The trouble, or the, if people are doing it directly because they want their screens in IMAX 
um, or they want their film in IMAX, then I think that does throw in a little bit of trouble in that, you know, it's very competitive to get your movie on an IMAX screen. Um, so if you're creating it with IMAX for IMAX, then sure, maybe you've got more of a chance. But it, it does sort of almost price out independent cinema, um, well, independent cinemas who don't have that yeah. uh, technology, but it also um, limits... There, there will be filmmakers that will be left behind if, if this is the way mm. that's going because their their art is more traditional. It's more cinema scope. Yeah, they have weird screen sizes. Then I think we'll we'll lose a bit of art. And in, with no disrespect to IMAX, isn't formatting for everybody for IMAX rather the tail wagging the dog a bit? You know, I mean, it's still a, a, a small number of screens in the world are IMAX, aren't they? Yeah. So why should we all have to put up with a, I mean, I put up with a smaller picture because I make my scope bigger than my wide picture. You know, I know I'm a bit weird and unusual, but um, so I've got I've got a smaller picture because it, it wants to run it in a few IMAX screens across the world. Yeah, I think I think if you've got masking, then you kind of covered. Um, you know, flatland, gun scope. I think it's for a lot of the cinemas that don't want masking, don't want the burden of masking maintenance because, you know, they move, therefore they need maintaining. Uh, and I understand it. And I, I even spoke to one integrator um, and was asking them if they can put moving masking in. And they were like, oh, we don't know how to do that. We can, put, we can put screens in, but we can't put moving masking in because nobody ever asked for it. We've not really got that skill set anymore. You get that? Now then, Jeffkin, also, if you've got screen masking uh, and you end up with this, you know, you get a lot of uh, different ratios uh, to play. You need to tweak that masking all the time mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and, you know, there are physical limitations also in if you have masking, if you if you both only have to the size, perhaps you can do it manually to fit everything. But, you know, if you play four shows a day and you want to program that in, you need, you know, to, to perhaps refurbish the masking also with more relays and uh, cutters and so on to, for it to stop at the right way. And one, also, once again, for the larger, uh, larger cinema chains, uh, to do that in <laughs> a lot of uh, a lot of auditoriums, that's also a pickle to to get hold of. It's it's of course more easier to do it like this because you don't really have to do anything. Perhaps you would like to, you know, uh, do a new macro in the projector so you can fill the height or fill the width uh, some somewhat. But the masking doesn't really solve because it's too much work perhaps for a lot of people. You know, to fill the screen with all these different ratios. But I agree with Tony also, you can't really restrain the creativity. They should be do whatever they like to do. But uh, So perhaps it's up to the exhibitor and us as who are helping you out to, to come up with solutions to do that. I agree. Um, you know, I was talking to Guillaume earlier on and he was saying that, you know, we, and he mentioned in his presentation as well about um, we're, we're sending emails to everyone left, right, and center. You know, when when Jurassic World's coming out, so it's in a two to one ratio, and you get a letter a couple of days before uh, saying, "Please, can you change your masking to this or change your screen shape to this?" I'm like, "Hang on a minute." So you and for a lot of smaller films, uh, you don't even get that that email, and you get a, a wrong information. I mean, uh, I wanted to to mention that that the last email I got on this was from a, a colleague who got a, a French film. Um, on the DCP, there's just an F in the CPL. Uh, when he plays it, he notices black bars. He gets in touch with the director, who says, I think my film is in 1.85, but I'm not entirely sure. Maybe due to DCP formatting, it's changed formats. Okay. Uh, then he gets in touch with the technical director of the distributor, who just replies, it's F for flat, played in flat. Okay. And then it's not unusual. Yeah, I know. And then he gets contacted by the director of photography of the film, who says, actually, mm. it's not 1.85, 1, 1. it's not flat, it's 2.0. And you yeah. should play it in, in flat, but then zoom a little to, to remove the black bars. And it's so just like, did, why? Sorry. 
Does okay. DCI, so does DCI um, have a um, naming convention for a DCP for ratios that are not flat and are not scope? I don't know that. I know yeah, Tony, to Tony would know the answer to that one. <laughs> Throw me under the bus there. I've got no idea. I've never <laughs> seen anything other than flat or scope. Yeah, but quite uh, quite often they're misnamed. Quite often a scope will be will be will be will have F on, you know, and you go, well, you're F'd because you should be est. I think the the naming convention refers to the container rather than the ratio. So you can have whatever container you want, um, but well, sorry, whatever ratio you want, as long as it's in one of the two containers, whether it's in the scope container or the flat container. But how does that help? How does that help us make a playlist in the right ratio for the screen? Then, if it just you can put that makes no sense. Surely it should tell you what ratio they want you to show it in. Surely. Well, that's that's logic. Yes, um, <laughs> absolutely, completely agree with you. And and then that brings on the the next question of well, we should be able to test it. Then you should be able to test the content, but that means you have to receive the content in good time and request a KDM, which won't automatically be granted until the studio... You know, 24 it, hours it, tops most of the time. Yeah. yeah, well, that's what we do. It's 24 hours before unless you request otherwise. So it, it brings in a logistical element and, and also the time of the people that work at the cinema, uh, the you know whoever's playing that film and doing the, the testing. Are they going to have time to do that? And then if they do, is that going to be a week in advance? So then, then, then they can sort out their macros and their masking or... You know, it's just difficult. It is. Communication is key on that. But it's so rare. It's so rare for exhibitors to have really good information about the film they're showing. Very rare. Very rare. And as someone who really cares, as we all do, about presentation, you know, that's important to me, that I know what ratio you want it in, what, you know, this is all important stuff. But unfortunately, exhibitors seem to be sort of the, the, the poor relation in that regard. Yeah. So what I'm doing really is I'm just questioning and challenging the status quo on flat and scope, uh, going back to my original point of whether we should be installing different ratio screens. Um, and I'm not saying we should before anyone starts throwing oranges or any other spare fruit at me. Um, I'm just trying to answer the, ask a question as to does digital and digitization change the way we install screens and, the, and the, the shape of those screens given the fact that we've got a lot of two to one ratios coming out with the, the chip is actually 1.896 to one or something like that um you know is there a logical reason to have a 1.896 ratio uh, so that we don't have to zoom in and out um but are and, you not in danger of 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 starting another wild west there because you know there are there are standards there are the screen should be a certain size for a certain auditorium but that is more and more going out of the window isn't it i mean there's a very famous london center of london cinema where the screen's just too bloody big it's just too ridiculously big and and all of these um you know um you know they're used to you know you you, you would calculate the size of the screen for the size of the auditorium, and it was comfortable to watch from most places in the auditorium. But if you start saying, well, I'll just put the, you know, don't matter what you put in now, because we can have all sorts of weird crap on the screen anyway, what size, what difference does it make? I think, I think it's a reasonably dangerous road to go down. I mean, not that I'm going to change it, but it just seems, you know, I thought there were supposed to be standards that we adhered to. That's the point. You're, we're talking about throwing standards out, aren't we, really? Uh, yes and no. I wouldn't say we're throwing standards out because I agree. I know which not going to send me on. But, um, it's not too large a screen, but no one could tell anyone who said that. Um, and it's not mine. And I'm, I'm just, I'm just trying to say we can still have the right size screen for the right auditorium um, and the seating capacity and everything. But do we, for instance, this screen here? I know you know you can see this one, guys. But I mean, could you in a, in another world? bring the bottom picture line down and create more of a two to one ratio uh, because to the slide, you know, we've got, we've got a traditional scope on the right hand side there with the scope image. And then we've got a, a flat uh, or a, yeah, it's a white five screen on the, on the left hand side. Uh, now the image, once it moves over, you know, it stays the same size. You know what I mean? It's not, 
it's not gone smaller. Um, all you're doing is making flat bigger because that's what flat would look like and that's what it would look like in here. I uh, should have shown a different picture, actually, because you can't see the edges. Um, but the point being is that if you was to make, for argument's sake, move this bottom picture line down and make this screen taller, then that's what you get in flat, uh, which means that you're not necessarily making scope smaller because the scope is still as wide as it could possibly go, but you're making flat bigger. Um, and is that something that we can have? Is that something that is acceptable? Is that something that filmmakers might move towards? I don't think they will. Well, but you no, know. I, I mean, we see evidence all the time on streaming movies, don't we? A lot of streaming movies and, and on television films are shot in cinema ratios, but they were never even intended to be in the cinema. So you get blacker bars top and bottom on a lot of television shows now, which is kind of makes no sense to me. If, if it's never going to be seen in a, in, a, in a cinema, so clearly they're trying to replicate the cinema image. They and, are. Uh, yeah. They did a bit of research on that, actually. Um, and they said that a lot of filmmakers are doing it now uh, because, one, they want it to look more cinematic, which is the irony, because it's like, well, it's not going in the cinema, but you want to make it more cinematic. And two is because uh, two to one ratios uh, and scope ratios uh, look better on a phone. Um, in those ratios, which a lot of people are watching TV shows, a lot of kids are watching TV shows on the phone, which is depressing. Um, but that really, hurts. That really hurts. Really true. Um, my lad sits in the living room with a 65 inch TV in front of him that has YouTube at the touch of a button, and yet he's watching YouTube on his phone in front of his face, which just baffles me. Um, so any, anyway, I mean, that's by the by, that's just weak. Um, so, you know, this, this is, this is the other issue that I'm trying to get, which is the you know, flat and scope, but it's the pre-show as well. The pre-show is something that winds me up because we get a lot of these flat, sorry, scope films in a flat container, pre-show trailers. And you can get a lot of adverts that are scope in a flat container. And what I'm trying to say is if we was to have a two to one ratio, then you're going to be able to have less pillar boxing with those screens uh, because it, it currently looks like that, which is smaller because it's in a flat container, which is top and bottom. But if we was to have, sorry, oh God, press the wrong button. Can't even see a mold. There we go. Um, so we can have that on a two to one rather than that on a scope, which means that you're getting a bigger image on the pre-show rather than this letterboxed and pillarboxed um, version of the image, static scope screen. Um, yeah, I know James at Savoy, he's very, very, very um, keen on this. He puts two to one screens in. That's what he does. So he gets a sort of compromise on, on, on both flat and scope. Yeah. But you get a bigger image on that. That's that's his answer. And he's mm. very happy with it. So Yeah. Then yet again you if you you know if you want to put in or uh, two to one or uh, a flat uh, ratio screen, you need to like build the auditorium a little bit higher. And then you solve the problem with the two meters at the back also. <laughs> yeah, unless you bring the bottom down. Yeah. Well there is another factor, but it's always best to bring the bottom down if you can rather than the top up. Because if you bring the top up, then the angle for the wheelchair positions changes, uh, which and then it can potentially go out of regulation because there is a regulation as well that's nodding into their nose. Um, that if you've got wheelchair positions at the front, you have to have a, a certain angle, otherwise you have people in wheelchairs looking up at the screen like that, which is not great. And you're losing the sight lines. Exactly. So you need the action speakers. Well, you do in here. And all and the other rooms. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very difficult not to hit the Atmos speakers in <laughs> really back the head. Um, so okay, we've got two minutes to just talk about um, screen um, gains and whatnot. So uh, this is what uh, Andy was talking about earlier. Basically, I put my thing. I was so pleased with my little graph. I put it on again. Um, copy and paste is wonderful. 
Um, so, you know, again, it goes down to that, you know, one of the things I've been really wrestling with, with designing cinema and specking cinemas is, you know, what game screen should I have as opposed to what projector I should have, whether it's a laser projector, whether it's a phosphor or an RB or an RGB. And you have to take into consideration all of these things now. Um, do you have this problem as well with understanding screens or do you just put in the most expensive <laughs> yeah, of course I do. No. Uh, uh, well, it's from case to case. Uh, of course, a, a lot of my customers uh, are perhaps the smaller cinema, so it's not that big a problem. Uh, and uh, also, a lot of them don't have been using uh, polarized 3D, so they have already a, a white, smart white screen mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, in Sweden, anyway. Uh, so for for my customers in in Sweden, that's not really a problem because mm -hmm. it's not the, the really large screens. So, but it's more or less from case to case, uh, and I try also to educate the customer and tell them about it that you can go either way, uh, and this is the price for this, and this is the price for that. So uh, it depends on the size and. Uh, sometimes you you know you get in just between two projector models and don't want uh, know what you want to choose and then you can have a little bit of gain on the screen and you can have a smaller one. Uh, but going to a, from a sustainability point of view, you know, surely and, and a green point of view, surely we should be trying to put in you know not the the most powerful projector we can find on the planet if we can help it. Um, maybe like you know. Um, and you know because there's a there's a certain maybe a certain responsibility that we need, need to have around you know how much power we're using and we know you know power is relatively cheap up here so we know, we're not worried about the luxury position um but you know we, we do need to consider that a lot of people need to consider that and if you can you know i'm, I'm, I'm going to wiggle these lines now watch um so rather than putting it in um at those <laughs> See, I'm a whiz on PowerPoint, me. <laughs> um, you know, rather than putting it in so we've got that big line, you know, if we can put in a, 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 a higher gain screen, that's like a broken record, don't I, Andy? If we can put a higher gain screen in, then we can potentially get that projector to run lower. You can eat, so you can wiggle again there. Um, we can get it to run a bit lower, which means we can get it to run longer. Uh, and the same with this line as well, you know, we can get it even lower. And the, we get it in solo, we might even be able to reduce the model of projector, which saves us money. So, you know, I'm not saying you should absolutely do this, but it is something that you must consider um, because it's it's expensive kit. Um, you could um, put a 10 grain, 10 gain screen in and get another five years out of your laser. Brilliant. Yeah. And then we won't be able to see anything from the speckle. <laughs> so... Uh, Rolf's looking at me now, saying, "Hurry up! We need to go. Bus is outside." Um, so that's 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 it. Has anybody got anything really final and very very quick to say? No. Uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. In the pub with PowerPoint. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much, especially to my two remote guests, who I'm really pleased could make it um, from uh, in and around London way. Down south ish way, up north, west I think way. Midlands, We're though. both in the Midlands, actually. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>